искам да покажа на сцената Иво Вачков от XI Group, който ще ни разкаже как да пишем стабилни приложения, които да държат на както натоварване, така и атаки, когато публикуваме в, как се казва, клауда или в облаците, когато ги качваме някъде да не седат при нас и съответно как да издържат те на предизвикателствата, които ни поставят а, новите реалности, най-общо казвани. Понеже тази лекция ще бъде изцяло на английски, ще направим още едно представяне на английски. It's a great pleasure to introduce Ива Вачко from XI Group, who is going to talk about resilience in the cloud or specifically how to approach application development when you are about to deploy in the cloud, what it means from performance, scaling point of view, and security point of view. So, welcome on stage, uh, Ivo Vachkov. Thank you. Uh, so, first question is, is everybody comfortable with English? Okay, so we continue in English. At any given time, if, if you have questions, if you, don't, if you don't understand something that I say, if you want to ask me something, please raise your hands, I'll try to accommodate. So, the topic of this lecture would be resiliency in the cloud, and this is based uh, on a bunch of learned lessons over the last seven, eight years that we've been doing applications in various cloud service environments. Uh, the underlying point is everything fails, and we expect th things to fail, and the more things you put in the cloud, the greater the chances that some of those will fail. If you used AWS in the early 2010s, you would be familiar with the regular issues in their network that they cannot expose to you in detail. So you need to figure out those on yourselves. If you are, uh, for example, using popular services like Redis, and you have a fairly loaded Redis setup in AWS in the early 2017, you'd be aware of a very nasty patch they did apply back then, which cut performance by 35-40%. So you'd either need to be rapidly increasing the number of hardware that you're using, or you need to be redesigning stuff. So those are just two of the lessons that kind of formed the basis for this lecture around the premise that everything in the cloud fails. The underlying motto here is fall seven times, stand up eight, and the idea is that you will, fail, you will fall down in those environments, but you need to be aware of the possibility and how to approach it. We will go over a hopefully condensed list of uh, subjects that I'd like to introduce you to in order to make you think in a different way when you create applications for being cloud native or when you migrate stuff from on-premises into the cloud. And the first idea here is the clear communication path. In many of the environments that we've inherited or we initially developed, there is no clear information path. You don't know where the information flows and how. You would start with a small set of nice services. They will communicate cleanly with one another, and then you add more, and then you expose more. And over time, you are facing a mess where uh, seemingly unrelated services are sending information to one another. The problem is becoming even worse with environments that uh, uh, tolerate containerized deployments. You are far more free, you, you are a lot more freer then and there to uh, end up in a position where everything can freely communicate with everything else and you usually utilize this with good intent until it is no longer controllable. There is a common uh, wall here that represents the number of communication channels within a system with 10 components. So think of it like this. You, are, you have three people in your team. You have three possible communication paths. Person A can communicate with person B and C. Person B can communicate with person A and C and person C can communicate with A and B. So three possible paths. When you add a fourth person, you have added one more component to the communication, 
but the number of communication paths drastically increases. It's now six. And when you add more, it increases further. And the more you add, the harder it is for you to track available communication paths and who's using them. In many environments, you will be facing minimal to limited monitoring, limited monitoring setup. And this is kind of the underlying uh, part of my work life where I do build monitoring for money because I need to eat stuff and buy stuff. So monitoring is very important if you need to control those communication paths. Another interesting uh, approach here is, and I know this is not pure DevOps nowadays, if you separate the control from developers into an either operational realm or some other technical governance body. So you would have a review of proposed communication. So when you build new services, you will define what those services will use and how. Yes, does not seem like the most elegant solution uh, in your very agile world, but it usually pays off in the long run. Why? Because you know what is communicating with what else. And when you need to build firewalls and security, when you need to implement some sort of isolation between your services, you have the blueprint already. You know what component is communicating with what other component. It is a function of control. Uh, another interesting benefit in a cloud environment, the more communication paths you have, the higher the rate of failure. So if you have two components that communicate with one another, obviously you have one possible communication path. But if you have 20, you cannot be certain in a moment of crisis, is it a component failure? You can hardly be certain in a moment of crisis, is it a component failure, is it a communication failure? You need to start figuring things out. The more things you need to check, the slower the troubleshooting process. <clears throat> so, and, and that's uh, assuming that your failures are hard failures, hard stop failures, so everything just stops. Uh, it is a whole other thing when AWS networking starts to lose packets. You are getting some communication through, but not all of it. And at that point, you need a different type of strategy to address this. We'll speak a little bit more about this later. But that's a whole other story we'll cover. So the general rule of thumb here, apply and enforce clear communication paths. This does not need to be represented in some enormous spreadsheet or enormous diagram. We do keep uh, very basic descriptions where every component will have a small table that says this component communicates with this other component on this other port. This is a basis of an enforceable firewalling structure. In our case, we do base uh, a bunch of definitions for a variety of technologies that we use underneath to deploy applications to enforce through firewalls the possible communication paths. It is not that hard. It is actually better in the long run because you will end up in a situation where you may need to implement security in depth. And in that case, this really pays off because you know that a particular component, although vulnerable, and although other parts of your system may be already exploited, cannot be touched through a vulnerability that already exists in the wild. The next is another favorite of mine. This is service discovery. I've given, I think, two talks now on this subject, and it is still somewhat that is either oversold over or just people ignore it use some sort of service discovery technology. I don't re really care if, if this is ETCD. I don't really care if it's console or if you build your own DNS service discovery setup. All of those would work if you use them, depending, of course, on your case. But the general approach here is do implement some sort of service discovery in an environment that is inherently unstable. Why? Because the more components you have, the more endpoints they will provide. Think of it as a Docker container. You have 20 different services. But in there, you have databases, you have web servers, you have any specific other APIs, either internal or external. All of those are endpoints. Yes, some of those will be behind load balancers. That is a step 
in the right direction, but you have others that are inherently standalone instances. So, more endpoints. And the lack of service discovery when operating in that environment means hard-coded stuff in your applications. I've seen libraries, very wide, uh, internally widespread libraries, that do hard code endpoints for Redis, for Postgre, for, in our case, Redshift, uh, for a variety of other components that we utilize within our deployments. The problem with that is you don't have the necessary control in case of a failure. Why? Because when you hard code an endpoint, you need to redeploy a bunch of stuff when that endpoint changes and things changed. Over personal example here, over the last two weeks, we've redeployed two major Redshift clusters. And this is a slow and tedious process that takes multiple hours to finish. And in the end, you are facing the problem of re, uh, redistributing that information in a hardcore way to multiple services that consume those components. So ideally, use service discovery. Again, it's not something that will be fast if you don't already do it, but it's a step in the right direction. My general recommendation is avoid anything hard-coded in a configuration file as a service endpoint. Obviously, there will be parts that will be hard-coded there. But for services, do deploy them through a service discovery. Do use if you can afford it or build it if you cannot use something that already exists. Do use configuration management of some sort that will dynamically build and deploy your configuration files and put them on the instances they need to be. The, another benefit uh, of using service discovery is the general control and the in many cases, this would be a single place where you can actually see what is currently running, what state it is running in, because of health checks. Uh, and another cautionary tale, do not rely on the availability of the service discovery unless you build it to be reliable. So, personal experience, single console server. Not a good idea if this thing fails. Next step, three console servers. Not a good idea in case of a network split, in case of a split brain situation. Why? Because after the split brain, they cannot uh, reconcile their internal state. In our case, the basic minimum out of console servers that we use is five for production environments. If for development, don't really care. We can recover it quickly. But for production, five console servers. For DNS SD, DNS service discovery, you use at least replicated DNS setup. And another cautionary uh, tale here, service discovery is not another database. Do not treat that as a database where you can quickly store stuff. Uh, we've seen that fail. I, I would generally recommend if you're gonna use key value stores, do not put your key values pairs in console, use Redis for that or anything other that's targeted at holding that information. Morals of the story, Avoid hard code endpoints, and whenever possible, apply health checks. Those are really cheap. My perfect example here is AWS Route 53. AWS Route 53 would provide you with a limited but functional set of health checks you can put on a variety of um, entries in your zone, in your zones, on a variety of records within your zone. If you use console, the console agent is flexible enough to either perform a simple HTTP, TCP, whatever port you have open checks, or you can even provide uh, small health check scripts on an arbitrary language that will do that for you and modify the service state, modify the service states based on their output. Next, and this is for the developers in the group. Please, when you develop modern cloud native applications or services do think about item potence. Item potence, to quote Wikipedia in this case, is the property of certain operations whereby they can be applied multiple times without changing the result beyond the initial application. Yes, it's hard to grasp at the first read, but think about 
typical uh, calculator. You have a desktop calculator, very simple device nowadays. What happens when you put the on button? It turns on. What happens when you put the on, when you click on the on button again? Nothing happens, it stays on. The state is already changed and the more you run that, the more you click on that button will not change the state. Do design your APIs, your components in the same way. Why? Because without it, it is very hard to implement retries. And we're assuming here that you have a variety of instances where your component will run on and some of those may fail. When you distribute calls or searches or requests to those instances, in case of that failure, if the operation is, is not idempotent, it is really hard to implement a retry. Why? Because you need to reconcile state. You need to know where the first thing ended, how you can move that forward. You need to deal with a far more in, you need to deal in a far more complex world of transactional processing. And that's usually uh, left for people with PhDs writing databases nowadays. So, item potence, preliminary requirement for elegant retries. And without it, you are facing complex retry procedures. And in a case of a critical issue, what you really care about is bringing the service back. You don't need to, usually you don't have to concern yourself with data recovery because this is important for data processing. If you do need to care about data recovery because you process transactions, you don't really want to bill somebody twice or multiple times. If you do really care about data processing, think what part of your world you can, you can model using idempotent operations. This is, uh, again, something we've seen pay off in a variety of APIs that we've developed over the years, or remote procedure call setups, but for any modern environment, I would assume this would be an API, some sort of programming interface, being at rest, or anything else. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so, do think about this type of operations when you design stuff. It is really important to augment, to either augment or replace existing functionality with item potent setup if you need to achieve some form of controllable recovery and scalability. Why? We'll speak more about that in, uh, more about that in the next state, in the next slide, which is don't keep local state. Uh, in a distributed world where you have multiple instances of your code running on a different instances, a common mistake that we've seen and so several months ago, we actually fixed such a case. Uh, we see a local state being kept. Those are usually things like counters, temporary files that are used in some computation or part of a, some pipeline or some transaction. As a result, if you lose an instance, you lose the local state. It can be bad behavior, it can be uh, of the algorithm that will fall, it can be due to instance restart, it can be due to instance disappearing, being unaccessible in the AWS, there are multiple ways that will lead to you losing local state if you have one. As a result, recovery becomes pretty hard. You, you, you cannot be certain, in that case, in the result of your computation. Uh, what we had in the past is basically a system that will count a number of uh, events going through, some, through several channels, and based on this count, we'll notify another service for something. So, a local state was kept basically on a local disk. Instance disappears because AWS decides this is running on a bad hardware, so it will terminate it for you, it will stop it for you. And in the process, you lose the local state. So, how can we reconcile the number of uh, events that we've processed on that instance to notify the people that pay us money for notifications, well, it's really hard. You, in that case, take, take the fault, don't notify them, don't get your paycheck or part of your paycheck. So the intent here is avoid everything in a distributed environment that you keep locally unless you have strategy how to reconcile potential losses. Uh, 
The other undesired benefit of keeping local state, this thing will re require mutable infrastructure. And by mutable infrastructure, you are familiar with the concept of immutability in infrastructure, I suppose, but just for the reference here, immutable infrastructure means that when you do, you don't, don't change existing stuff. When you need to deploy a new application, you effectively bootstrap a whole new copy of the infrastructure, put the new application on it, and switch the traffic onto that deployment. In a mutable infrastructure, what you do is you modify existing infrastructure. Keeping local state would require you to modify the existing setup. You cannot seamlessly migrate from this set of, from this set of servers or components to another set of servers and components just by moving traffic there. Why? Because without local state, you will lose what you've currently been working on on the new set of instances. So you need to do mutable infrastructure. And in my opinion, this is generally bad. So avoid this if if you don't really need to implement it in that way. The general approach here is called stateless. Use stateless design. Do not keep state locally. Outsource it either to a different service or to a different component that is geared towards keeping that state. Again, don't really care if this is a database, is this, if this is a remote file server, if this is uh, some key value store, NoSQL solution, whatever floats your boat here. As far as you are not risking losing the result of existing computations because you lose a component within the system, especially if that part is uh, important as a subsequent step, as an entry point for a subsequent step. And how, how can we combine a bunch of those things? Well, the, the simple example here is use queues. So I, I, I would assume that you're familiar with the, so, with the software uh, equivalency of queuing. And there are multiple providers out there that will give you some functionality in that area, but try to apply queuing mechanisms throughout your application. This is how, to, this is how you build resili resiliency into multi-component environments. Why? Because direct service calling will fail. You may have network issues. You may have uh, bad firewall deployed. Somebody made some change that somehow got approved by people that don't understand the impact of it. This thing was rolled into production. Firewall blocks traffic. Things start to fail. You may have a misbehaving component. You may have a failing service. You may have a, you may have a bad bad API deployment of some sorts, this will all lead to some sort of failure in the service you're trying to call. And when you do direct call, think of this as a HTTP curl calls. When you do those, the service in the back is currently giving you a, some sort of bad request, some sort of a failure. What you're going to do? The short answer is you, you're spiraling down a road of a local store where you can keep a bunch of things you need to retry when the service is available. What can you do to reduce that complexity and make things a little bit better? Well, use software equivalent of queuing, queues. Do build your requests in a packetized form, send them to a queue, wait for somebody else to consume the queue. This way you can control through operations methods how your data propagates, how fast your data propagates, what is the cost of your current setup. You don't need to really upscale stuff if you don't need real-time processing. You can leave it over a course of a day or over a larger or smaller time increments to catch up. What we usually see in a, a popular customer-facing cloud setups is that you have non-equal uh, distribution of your uh, requests to the service based on which time of day you're working. So obviously, th think of it as a popular TV. This is our go-to case here. I think, think of it as a popular TV. You have a prime time for a reason. Why? Because this is when most people will be watching TV. Same thing goes for your services. There will be a time of the day where those will be most or highly loaded, and there will be time in the day where those will be less loaded. You can use that daily cycle to implement a batch processing, if you don't, of course, if you don't need real time, where things will catch up and you don't need to either spin up or keep 
extra infrastructure to hold on uh, to the processing of that particular queue you're putting messages into. This is uh, somewhat related to asynchronous design, and you need to be careful when you do that, especially if you come from a synchronous world, and I would generally advise you to really think before start hacking APIs in that way, but it is the right path forward. Another benefit of using queues, you can, with a small set of tooling, with a, with a small set of tools, replicate traffic to a separate environment. You can do things like A-B testing, you can uh, siphon part of the production traffic, duplicate part of the production traffic into a staging environment where you can uh, see how the new version of your code will work with actual production patterns. Why? Because common case is you don't have testing frameworks that replicate production environments. You have a testing framework that will try to cover it all, but not with the same rate or not in the same ratio as things happen in production. And it, it's a common problem. We did everything to test it. It passes all the tests. We put it in production. It starts failing. Why? Because the test is not representative of the, of the production traffic. By using simple things like queues and moving data around easily, we, over the course of the years, developed multiple tools to fan out messages around, to duplicate, to replicate uh, packets of information between queues. That helped us, first of all, introduce separate environments where we test concepts, also allows us to replicate stuff. And in many cases, this is, if you can afford it, this is a really nice backup strategy to put part of your daily traffic in an environment that you can consume later. Why? Because it may be important for you to backtrack steps that your code took to figure out what the fail why the failure uh, exists, how does it happen. And without a proper sequence of events, you may not be able to quickly replicate it otherwise. So, queues are nice because they give you operational freedom and they give you control over parts of your infrastructure. Ideally, nowadays, you should be aiming for something called stream processing. There are multiple articles for new software architectures emerging in that area. It's nothing new. It's rehash of ideas from the late 80s, early 90s. But it is a proper path forward if, in many cases, even in real-time scenarios. Uh, for environments where you do batch processing on a regular basis, this is the perfect cheap and cheerful solution that will uh, run you for multiple years. To give you an example, we have a simple ETL that moves multiple terabytes of data, simple ETL pipeline that moves multiple terabytes of data every day, and it runs using a sequence of queues and processors that we even dynamically scale multiple times a day as much as we need and only when we need them. Next basic idea for resilience, graceful degradation. It is okay for single process to just stop working. I, I would generally advise you to implement your processes with a hard stop behavior. So when things go wrong, it will just stop. It will not try to do some smart thing and recover on itself. That being said, it is not okay for your whole system to just hard stop in case of a simple failure. So what you do, you try to design your system using techniques like self-stabilization, like isolation, fault isolation, in a way that break, simple component break will only degrade the performance. It will not stop everything, or it will not fail everything. Think of the reference. Think. Think this in a reference with the previous slide. You're using queues. You're, you, you have a component that will just output data into a queue. What happens if the consumer stops? The queue will grow. That is a form of degradation. Yes, your queue will potentially limit, reach the limit of the available memory or some price point that you don't want to reach. But your service is generally working for the consumer. Yes, the dashboards are not updating. For example, yes, you don't see the latest data, but the service is generally functional. 
When you recover the component that's failing, the consumer of that queue, the data will be gradually processed. You will see the information piling up in your web interface. <coughs> what happens if instead of using queues, you do have something like API calls? Well, user sees ugly 404s or no data available, stuff like that. And what's the problem with that? You lose the calls that should have been passing through the system for that time. And we, we did have a, a, scenario, a scenario where we, we were losing uh, vital information because we were losing calls. As a typical, in our case, this was some notification. We do create an artifact, we put it somewhere, we send a notification using a stateless service, and the component that needs to pick up that new information processes. When you restart it, in the process of receiving notification, it will lose that notification. So we replaced it with a queue. Now I don't really care if that component is down for a second or for an hour. It's nice for this component to be constantly up, but it will survive an hour long uh, downtime without any production impact. So graceful degradation, implement, typical example of graceful degradation. Figure out a way to make your components, when failing, not failing anything else within the system. Uh, how self-stabilization components, self-stabilization implementations, self-stabilization systems. We do employ large amounts of operational code that will try to recover in case of an instance failure, that will try to recover uh, in case of a rapid increase of users, in case of increased error rates. We will trigger events internally and these pieces of code will try to bring the system back to a stable state. This is applicable right now in a limited subset. It cannot be abstracted to any given scenario, but it is possible and it is a work in progress for us. Another important point here is reduce single points of failure. Everybody should know this and everybody generally knows this, but what they do is they still do use a single MySQL server. What happens if this thing goes down? Everything goes down because your PHP, Python, whatever framework is not really equipped to deal with the main database being brought offline. So reduce those, replace them with technologies that account for availability. In our case, we tend to follow, the fo we tend to follow uh, basic instructions like if you don't need, if you really don't need a relational database, don't use a relational database. If you need to just to store some stuff around, use things like AWS S3, single, uh, simple files on the file system, or use technologies like Redis that you can clusterize, you can upscale if needed, you can implement in a highly available way. This brings us to the following testability of your components and system. Uh, I've spoken multiple times that, and I, I'm sorry if I'm going to insult some, some of you guys, but in many environments, the quality assurance should be implemented by the people with greatest knowledge of the product and the technology. Unfortunately, in the modern IT, the quality assurance is done by people that have the least amount of information and knowledge about the technology. So what kind of assurance is that? Well, the short answer is crappy. So assuming you are not or you don't want to be left in that environment, start designing components in a way that they can be tested. Lack of testability means lack of comprehension. You don't understand it if you cannot test it. If you don't understand it, how are you modifying it in the long run? So, design for testability. If you, again, if you can't test it, you cannot uh, sign off on a repeatable behavior. Why? Because you cannot replay a set of events and demonstrate that the same set of outcomes will come out of this component or service. And why is this important to you? Because when a person subscribes to pay five bucks a month, he expects to pay five bucks a month, not 10 bucks this month, zero bucks next month. Generally, that's the idea behind testability. You have determinism, which is always good, which is always 
uh, desirable quality of a software system if you can explain simply how it behaves and if you can demonstrate how it behaves, not how it should. That's a different discussion, but how it actually does. So, design for testability, generally test everything. I, I don't mean that to go into extreme. I've seen edge cases where people would expect, where QA personnel would want to test a Redis set operation. Well, kind of pointless. It usually works and it's somebody else's uh, problem for this thing to work. When it reaches us, we expect it does. So you don't really need to test that, but test a component based on the commonly understood specification. It does not need to be written Everybody needs to have common understanding of how this thing behaves. And my favorite subject, proactive monitoring. There is a common understanding in the industry that you should wake people up only if something breaks. My philosophy is the other way around. Wake somebody before things break. Why? Because Otherwise, you're already losing money, you're already losing calls, you're already losing requests, you don't have data pr being processed in time. So, at this point here, yeah, you walk a bunch of people, they go sleep into a war, war room, or whatever the term you're using, and they start figuring out uh, how we can tell the customers that it's their problem, not ours. So, typical example, Use proactive monitoring, uh, a word on stuff before it breaks. Do follow trends. There are nowadays technologies and techniques that would allow you to figure out when things will break. You are provided with a tooling either in cloud service providers or external companies or within the open source community that will give you some rough predictive behavior, how things will break, when will they break. You know this will happen. We are not discussing fringe events here where somebody bad happened in AWS, they lost half of a data center and your half infrastructure is gone. That's obviously uh, something that you cannot predict. But when will the disk on this server or in, on that database finish, given your current trend, you can be really precise about it. When will, what will be the number of concurrent requests to your API that will make them, make it delay, introduce delays above the acceptable rates? You can also tell. Why? Do performance testing figure it out? Or see what happens in production. See how this set of components behaves on that type of infrastructure and you can predict with a a uh, reasonable amount of certainty when things will go down. So, do proactive monitoring and a word on it. Those are two screenshots that I took last night from a system that we use. This is not Grafana screenshot from internet. This is existing stuff we work on daily. And because they tell me it's five minutes to the end, do you have any questions? Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, great insights. Um, thank you. You have a lot of experience as it seems. Uh, yeah. How many years, by the way? Sorry? How many years have you been gathering this, uh, have in, been working in, in this cloud, area? In building cloud native applications since uh, 2012. Since 2012, yeah. which started with it? AWS. Seven years. Seven like, years of yeah. AWS and other services. Yeah. Okay, so who's gonna dare to ask <laughs> some questions? It is possible also in Bulgarian if you're not comfortable with English, and it's up to you to decide which yeah. language of preference he's going to use. Maybe this guy. <laughs> okay, ask a question. You can use this microphone over there. Uh, you see? Over there. Okay. Yes. I think this is good, Kirsten. <laughs> can, you, can you point us to a case where using queues is necessary? 
is unnecessary. Undeserved, unnecessary. Is yeah. there a case? Uh, I guess so, yeah. But uh, I cannot think of one of the top of my mind. I would generally assume that a system that relies on a really low latency times, uh, think of it uh, tick, stock tick processing systems, or any form of high frequency trading nowadays, those would be undesirable case for the typical queues that we know and use in the industry. But that being said, I know that the common database those guys use is something that you can model queues on top of. So again, that's a mixed answer, I guess. <laughs> I cannot point to a particular case where this is undesirable. Okay, somebody else? If you're not asking questions, I'm going to ask questions. OK, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, is this all? OK. Hi, and thank you for the presentation. And thank you. A couple of questions from a perspective of someone who has not developed or deployed a highly scaling system. So question one, how do you prevent, generally speaking, your, date, uh, your service discovery or your load balancer or your message queue from being a point of failure? The, the short answer here is, for service discovery, we do use technologies that would be highly available themselves. Typical example, console cluster. Or if you are into the ETCD world, ETCD cluster. Another example is DNS service discovery. DNS-based service discovery, because of the inherently highly available nature of the DNS subsystem, is highly available on its own. Yes, it's. Uh, slower to propagate new information, so it may be suitable for some types, but not for others, but it's generally highly available. The second question, load balancers. Uh, how, how are you going to control the availability of a load balancer? The short answer is we, we don't do it with one. We deploy, we do keep a parallel deployments of the same service behind two separate load balancers. And we do have a DNS round robin that will just distribute the traffic to one load balancer or the other. This is how we deal with highly available load balancers. And for the queues, well, the short answer, again, is use something that has built-in uh, high availability. I cannot point you to several not that good solutions that exist out there. And shameless self-promotion here. We are currently working on, uh, on a highly available queuing system ourselves for this particular need. OK, thank you for that. And yeah. question number two, is there a possibility for conflict between advice to use uh, network service discovery that basically possibly every component has to talk to and advice one keeping clear communication paths? Can there be a conflict? Ideally, no. Ideally, no. But from the ideal world of how things should work to the real world, yes, there, may, there exists a case where introducing a service discovery or using existing service discovery may introduce more communication paths. If you can limit that, what we do is we enforce incoming and outgoing firewalls on every component. So this way we track what goes where, what type of calls originate from an instance or what type of calls the instance is uh, accepting. So this is how we try to manage the complexities of uh, introducing yet another communication path in the system by using service discovery. Thank you. OK. Um, somebody else, maybe? I have one last question that is a more broad one. When it is a good time to go in the cloud, because some argue that you don't always need microservices and you don't always need to go in the cloud. And there are occasions where this can be an overhead and actually yeah. you can shoot yeah. yourself in the foot. So yeah. what's your opinion then? My, my personal opinion is that you don't have to go to the cloud. This is not a must, even nowadays. And I'm telling you this as a person who sells services to manage other people's deployments in the cloud. You don't need to do it. In my opinion, the correct time to consider uh, migration to a cloud is when elasticity becomes important to you. And by elasticity, I don't mean quick provisioning of components. You can do a quick provisioning with enough cache everywhere. 
you can just buy hardware, put it in a co-location or data center, and to provision, provision stuff when you need it. What I mean is elasticity, when you actually plan to implement an elastic service. And by elastic service, I mean a service that will scale based on the actual processing capacity you need, being it request per second, being it number of users that you need to process, being it number of files, being it a uh, rate of something, rate of uh, network traffic, rate of customer requests, rate of uh, whatever, that will drive this elasticity. When you have that case where this is now important to you, usually this is something that you want to scale quickly. Not always the case, but usually the case when you have a thing or service that uh, is about to scale. When, when you are actually planning to benefit from the elastic nature, then is the time to migrate to the cloud. Otherwise, you are offsetting CAPEX, which is initial spending on hardware, to OPEX, which is monthly spending on somebody else's resources. Okay, it really makes sense. All right, any other questions then to Ivo? Of course, you can approach him anytime. Yeah. Uh, are you going to be here tomorrow yeah. also? Yeah. Okay, so you can find Ivo and go and talk with him because as we can all see from this presentation, these seven years of experience in quite valuable. So thank you Ivo for sharing this in the Open Fest. Thank you.